It's always scary when Ray Andreos introduces you. <laughs> it is uh, really a special joy to be here. Southside has been dear to my heart for over a dozen years. Um, I've been personally invested in Alpha Family in a big way and uh, very thankful for our long-standing relationship with Southside and seeing the hands, the, God's hand of grace on you and your church through a lot of tough times in the last 12 years. And uh, just so fun to see Ken again and see him absolutely delighted to let me speak. That's crazy. <laughs> I'm not preaching on Romans. <laughs> Although I could start over again, but <laughs> I, I mentally sort of threatened to do the whole overview of Romans in one sermon. <laughs> but I couldn't do that to my brother, so I'm not going to do that. No, it, out, um, it, is, it is so good to be co-laborers with you all in so many ways. Um, I, I do want to take the liberty, just because this is kind of who I am, to to tell a story, um, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson decided to go camping and they joined the men's camping trip from Southside Bible Church. Um, in the middle of the night, Dr. Watson elbows Sherlock and wakes him up. He said, Sherlock, this is amazing. The front range has such an amazing view of the stars. Isn't it glorious? It's fantastic. Just breathtaking. What does it all mean? Sherlock says, it's elementary, my dear Watson. We didn't register and they took our tent away. <laughs> <laughs> you guys register for the men's camping trip, will you? <laughs> I, I hope I didn't offend anyone, but I... Um, yeah, we, we dearly appreciate the ministry, and, and what God is doing here is, is amazing, and you've come to a, a wonderful place in your missions development, um, and it's a joy and a privilege to, to be asked to be kind of a participant in that. So thank you, Ray, and the elders and missions board for allowing me to, to have a small part in that. I, I'm delighted. We're looking forward to seeing what God is going to do. I do want to um, add a little more information about us. My wife is the angel, and I'm that other guy. So uh, I'm, she has been here before for meetings, and I'm sorry that she can't be here today because of other obligations, but we are a part of a church plant. Um, I had been an elder at Faith Bible Church, which many of you know about Fire Fellowship, is a, is a Fire Fellowship sort of anchor church, and um, we have appreciated that very much, but... I've been serving as an elder and the missions leader of um, Faith Bible Church for many years, and over time, I sort of persuaded the elders that the church really need to be involved in local church planting, not just church planting around the globe in really difficult places, unreached places, but local church planting. And uh, finally, I guess they got the message from the Spirit of God and not just me, and said, okay, let, let's, let's do this. And we studied it, and we picked a place. Like, this is the place that's in between other good Bible teaching churches, and this, this little place and area not too far from our church is a place that really needs a good, gospel-centered, Bible-preaching church. And so we decided to do that, but we just didn't have the resources. And God supplied resources from another church actually near Chicago, to come alongside us, and so we, I'm, I'm officially one of the elders sort of sent out from Faith Bible Church to be committed to Christ Church of South Metro Atlanta, as the official name, but in the little town of Tyrone. Uh, in our area, the Bible Belt, there's a lot of uh, health and wealth kind of gospel, a lot of prosperity gospel stuff. There's a lot of uh, surfacey kind of cotton candy kind of churches. Um, and they don't really get into the word like we would like, and apparently other people are hungry for that. And God has had his hand of mercy and blessing on us. We've been in operation about 18 months, and it's exciting to be part of a church plan. It's a lot of work. My other fellow elder, 
that's in sort of the same age bracket as I am. He's a 30-year pastor, and now he's serving in a missions ministry, and he's a fellow elder with me, and our church plant pastor is the third elder. And he said, I have never seen an elder in my 30 years of pastoral ministry that had to work so hard as we have. And um, it's kind of true. So that's the way it is. So you guys pray for us. Um, I do have a card, typically known in mission circles as a prayer card, that's out on the welcome table if you want to get one of those. I don't have too many, but they're out there. And it's especially good because it shows my wife, so that's great. Um, There's also a card of a podcast that I do. Um, Missions on Point is the name of the podcast. If you're taking notes, um, you can listen to it. It's really easy to listen to. It's not a lot of fluff. It gets right to it 15 minutes a week. And I've had some pastors and some mission leaders say that now that they are learning everything about missions and missionaries and church missions from Missions on Point, they're requiring it of their elders and missions board. No, no pressure. Um, obviously, I'm here because of missions and for the mission's interests, and I just felt that I wanted to take a, a model church, a Great Commission church in the Scripture, and kind of unpack it. So this is not strictly an expositional message, um, but it is more descriptive and finding lessons and observations from the church at Antioch, which is in Acts ch- chapter 13. But even before we get there, I need to leave you with one message. If you don't get anything else, get this. All the guys in the meetings on Friday and Saturday got this, so they they have heard this before. But if you haven't heard this, I hope that it is a wonderful surprise blessing from the Lord to have this bit of insight. So turn to Matthew 28. We're going to look at what is most commonly known as great, the Great Commission passage. The Matthew passage is the most well-known, but don't be fooled by that. If you don't have a lot of connections or understanding of missions, missions isn't only in this verse. Psalm 96, you, read, you remember that just a few minutes ago? That was a mission psalm in the Old Testament. And missional types of commands and instruction from Jesus Christ himself are scattered through all the Gospels and the book of Acts. So you need to catch this one thing. Jesus, in verse 18 in Matthew 28, Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, this is the first point in a much larger outline, which I'm not going to cover, that says simply this. The Christians in the New Testament, guided by the Holy Spirit, understood that obedience to the Great Commission resulted in new churches being started everywhere the gospel went. You know, what did you get that from, David? Well, when you look at this with fresh eyes, you see that this great commission, and together with the other passages as well, cannot be obeyed and fulfilled apart from the planting of new local churches. You with me? I'm seeing a lot of eyes going glaze over. What? Because you know what? In the popular media, even in Christian media today, we hear a lot of claims that people are doing Great Commission work. They're winning souls. They're evangelizing. They may even be discipling. And a lot of organizations are built on that. Evangelism, discipleship, we're doing the Great Commission. And I say, "Uh uh-uh, no. That's only part of it. When you look at this, The going and making disciples. Making disciples is the key verb here. It's the key thing that is in the center of this thing. Making disciples does imply that you have to do evangelism to have disciples to disciple. So you have evangelism and discipleship for sure, but the Great Commission doesn't stop there. It says that you 
baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Generally speaking, through the flow of the New Testament, that means you introduce them into the community of saints in a local church. They are identifying with Jesus Christ and becoming part of a body of Christ. It also assumes that there are leaders to baptize them. And further in the verse, it says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. How do you do that? Well, friends, we meet together on Sunday for that. We meet together regularly with people that we know and live nearby, the mutually committed body of believers. You can't fulfill this verse without having a local church. It just doesn't work. You have recognized, qualified leaders observing the ordinances, baptism, and the Lord's table, and teaching them regularly all of this book. That's what they're doing. So if you hear someone say, hey, I'm doing the Great Commission by, uh, you know, doing the summer trip thing, or I'm doing the Great Commission by doing this little thing or that little thing that is ancillary to the bigger task of discipling, teaching them all things, and gathering in local churches, you need to just smile, be loving, gracious, and say, that's only part of the Great Commission. When you fulfill the Great Commission, you do that. Now, like I said, this is the first of many, many evidences through the New Testament that the New Testament under, uh, Christians understood that. And we're going to take a glimpse of that when we look at the church in Antioch. But before we get into that, let's pray. Father, we're here for obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ in all ways. Thank you for the outpouring of love and mercy through the cross because you chose us and we responded in faith and repentance in him alone. So ask that you, by your Spirit, would help us to see Christ exalted in this great commission ministry through the model of the church in Antioch. Open our hearts, open our minds to love you more and serve you better. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we're going to get into the book of Acts. The book of Acts was written to people who had heard directly and indirectly by those who heard Christ pronounce this Great Commission and all the other Great Commission passages of the uh, Gospels and early chapter in Acts, chapter 1. So there were a lot of people that heard Jesus say these kinds of things. And as they were driven out of Jerusalem, they spread around. So we're going to take a look at that as this church in Antioch of Syria is formed. Acts chapter 11. Start in Acts chapter 11. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also. That's Greek speaking people that were not Jews, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. Now, this scenario is pretty interesting. From chapter 10, Peter had the experience of seeing Gentiles come to faith in Jesus Christ through the preaching of the gospel. And this was reported back to the Jerusalem church and challenged, and Peter stood up for the new believers saying, they didn't have to go through all the Jewish ceremony. They didn't have to do all that stuff. They can even eat bacon. It's okay. <laughs> so 
other things are happening here. He's reporting to the church, and then this Luke is built, Luke, the author of Acts, is building up toward this pivotal point in the whole book of Acts. This is the history book of the New Testament. Luke writes it with great detail and care, having researched the data and the facts of the stories and puts them together here by inspiration of the Holy Spirit for everyone to read and for us to read and benefit from. So the character of the church was such as this is a very cosmopolitan city. In fact, it's about the third largest city in the Roman Empire. It's an influential port city in this part of the, the area of Palestine, north in Syria. And so in this city, those being driven out and going out with the gospel come to Antioch. And of course, the, the first people they talk to are the natural people they have affinity with, if they're Jewish at all or coming out of Jerusalem. They talked to other Jews. But some of them were not from Jerusalem. Their home place with other places, and they naturally talked to Greeks. There's a, it's a lot of Greek-speaking business people all throughout the city. It's a big city for its time. And many people came to saving faith. They were added to the Lord. It's interesting that in this little section that the Lord is used more than the term Christ because the Greeks would have related better to that. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is King. Jesus is Messiah, Christ. But these Greeks related to him apparently the way Luke records it as Lord. And Barnabas, good guy, thought well of by the church and worked in and with the church. So next verse, the church is formed. Secondly, the church is taught. Acts 11.25, Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch for a whole year. They met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. So this is the formation of the church, and then the church is taught. Um, apparently, Barnabas went to some lengths to find Saul. He remembered Saul. He had vouched for Saul earlier after his conversion with the apostles in Jerusalem. He knew Saul was really well taught. And at this point in time, he may have known that Saul had had like private tutelage with Jesus Christ himself. We don't know exactly how all that happened, but he certainly met Christ in his conversion experience on the road to Damascus. And Christ revealed to him that he was going to be the apostle or messenger to the Gentiles. So Saul was in his home place. Here we go. Saul was in his home place, but we don't know exactly where, and apparently Barnabas didn't know either, so he searched for him, found him, and brought him back. All right, guys. I hope you have ears to hear. I don't have ears to say. I'm going to grab you the mic. It actually stays on your ear, so you can use that. Here we go. I'm going to set you up. Thank you, brother. Amazing. Here we go. So this church continued to grow. He did get Saul, who we later know as Paul, and they were teaching the church. What were they teaching the church? They were teaching the church about Christ. Of course, by this time, the New Testament had not been written, so they're teaching Christ and the prophetic fulfillment of the Messiah through the Old Testament. That's what Barnabas and Saul knew best. But they also know all of the stories in the life of Christ because that was pretty common knowledge all throughout Palestine. I didn't mean to create a crisis here with the mic.
Are we on? I love you too, brother. <laughs> we have this thing. We're, we're, we're good. Thank you, Lord, for the mercy of these people. Um, so there you go. The church is taught teaching is a priority. And we see in this last phrase that the church has a reputation as Christ followers. Um, they are they're followers of Christ. And so they're first called Christians. Isn't that interesting? So from Antioch forward, the Christian church has a moniker. We know what it is. It's different than the Jewish religion. It's just not followers of the way, as it was so often in Jerusalem. It's not just a, a sect of Jews. This is a different religion centered on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what they're known for. What a great reputation. Are you guys known for that? Are you known as Christians? I like to tell people all the time, when you're going to school, kids, if you go to a, a, a classroom, plant your flag for Christ early. It not only will give you opportunities to talk about Jesus, it'll save you a lot of problems. If people know you're a committed Christian, they're not even going to tempt you with junk as much. You will be, but not as much. You go to high school, you go to college, plant your flag for Christ early. Be known as a Christ follower. Love Christ. Show it in your life. Not only will God use that as a testimony and a witness, people who are desperately in need of help will come to you because you know the answer. Amen? That's how we live our lives. Our neighbors need to know that we are Christ followers. Make no mistake about it. It's not like the great American you know, castle with the moat. You, you put the garage door opener up, you drive in, you close it, the moat is, you know, you're, you're out of touch with the neighbors, you stay inside, you watch your media, you do your devices, whatever, and you, know, you live your life and eat your food, and you just don't have contact with your neighbors, get out. Let them know you're a Christian. Meet them in the yard. Figure out how to let your life shine for Jesus. It's not that hard. These guys did it. They were brand new Christians. They didn't know any better. They just did it, and they were known as Christians. Awesome church. That's the character of what we want Southside to be as well, and Christ Church in South Metro Atlanta. Thirdly, the church is responsive to needs. We're still in 11. We haven't even gotten to 13 yet, but follow. 11.27, now in those days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea, and they did so sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. A lot of interesting little dynamic things happening here. They knew of a need among the brothers that would be among the brothers, the other Christians, and for fellow Christians, they sent them relief. Notice it does not say, but it's an argument from silence, I grant, that they sent relief to everybody that was hungry everywhere. They sent relief to the brothers. That's, that's who they were focused on helping. And they sent it, the elders sent it by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. So Barnabas and Saul are paired up already. They were teachers together. We'll see that they are part of the eldership in the church. And now they're being sent out with this relief money. It's also interesting, this is an ethical thing. Every time you see money in the New Testament like this, it is with at least pairs of people, there's accountability. There's nobody pocketing something on the way. Maybe that's Jewish, I don't know. But they, they have that care to make sure that all of the funds received were transmitted. And they sent it with Barnabas and Saul. So the church takes care of fellow believers in need. 
They are probably also doing this among their own church by extension, right? So people in need in the church receive that. Later we see Paul talk about that in his epistles to the churches of taking care of brothers in need. Fourthly, Acts 13. So turn over to Acts 13. Verse 1, the church sends. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a long, lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. There's so much in here, we're not going to unpack it all. But this is a glorious moment in the, in the life of the church. And imagine now, just a little snippet, a glimpse into this, Barnabas had been sent from Jerusalem to Antioch. And he was actually closer to home because his, his home people were on the island of Cyprus. So they're very close. And he's familiar with the Greek culture and all of that. Paul comes, Saul comes, and they minister. The church grows. They're given tasks to do by the elders. And now this the elders, at least, are praying and fasting, and the Lord says, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul to the work, for the work to which I've called them. Realize that Barnabas, I mean, that Saul, rather, who later we know as Paul, I know it's confusing, at least I am, it seems, but Saul was recognized as an apostle, a capital A apostle, equivalent to the apostles who walked with Jesus in his lifetime. He was recognized by the apostles in Jerusalem as an apostle. So as an apostle, he received a special individualized revelation from God that said, you are going to be a missionary to Gentile people and speak before kings and authorities. How long was it between Paul knowing that and Paul actually being sent by the church in Antioch? At least 12 years. Can you imagine the patience and the humility that it took for this well-educated, recognized teacher and elder of the church to wait for the church to send him? I love uh, the title of an article that says, You may be called, but don't go until you're sent. This is Paul. Did he have every right? Yes. Did he have all the things lined up? Could he have demanded, even as a capital A apostle, to say, hey, God told me that I should go. You should send me. Apparently, he didn't do that. That's not what the record reads. He took his time. He stayed engaged, involved in ministering in the local church, perhaps growing in skill as he did, to the point where the elders are actually revealed by the Lord to set them apart and send them out. Well, that's cool. I mean, as a missionary, I know, and I hold this line, that uh, along with Michael Griffiths from a long time ago, who said, an individual can express their willingness to go, but only their local church can validate their fittedness to go. You get that? So, a young person, or a middle-aged person, or an older person who says, I feel that God's called me to be a missionary. Great. Let's prove it. If the church sees in you the skills, the character, and the knowledge required to be a missionary, then they will affirm and confirm your call. The missionary call is not just individualized, personal. It's not just this inner compulsion. You need to have an inner compulsion. I fear for the person who says, um, I don't want to be a missionary, and the church says, yeah, you got to go anyway. That's kind of backward. Um, we, we have a better example of that in Timothy later, where Timothy is drafted to be a missionary, but he's willing, and he's, and he's competent to go, so that's, that's cool. But 
People tend to misunderstand, especially in American culture, we're so individualistic, we just don't get it. We think, oh man, God's spoken to me, and I go like, okay, how? Do you see it in letters in the book here? Um, let's, let's prove it. Let's confirm it. Let's affirm it by recognizing and seeing demonstrated your godly life that matches up to the qualifications of a church leader. You want to be a missionary? You are a church leader at some level. You need to have that kind of qualification. You need to be qualified in your competence in ministry. Have you worked in the nursery or the toddler group? That will test your sanctification. <laughs> they may not all sleep, but they will all be changed. <laughs> How about middle schoolers? That's a zoo. How about high schoolers? They don't know which end is up, and they don't know that they don't know which end is up. <laughs> what about young marrieds trying to figure it out? What about you know, single adults? What, what about older people? They, they've, got, they've got a lot of things on their mind and heart in life. It's, it's tough. Getting old is not for sissies. But ministering in the church... And seeing others observe you do that. Having the competence biblically and theologically to handle the Word of God, even cross-culturally. That takes a lot of work, friends, to get to that point. Uh, thankfully, it doesn't take 12 to 14 years like Saul had in his personal ministry from the time he first knew of his call to the time he was actually sent. In the context of the church worshiping and praying and recognizing the Spirit's work and validating these men as competent, as qualified to go, then the church is obedient to send out qualified missionaries. Listen, I've been on the field a long time. I've worked with missionaries and traveled to mission fields a long time. And frankly, there's quite a few of them that never should have been sent. Some of them kind of sent themselves or obligated people to send them out. And they're out there and, and um, they just don't have the tools. They don't have the qualifications to really stick it out long term and be effective in ministry. And that's a sad thing because in a way that besmirches the ministry of Jesus Christ and the church. It's tough. It's tough. It's better to take your time and be well qualified than to be broken. I know a lot of people who felt like they wanted to be missionaries and went out to the field and came back within three, four years and never went back again. And they have invested their life and they've told everyone of their friends and family and their church and everybody that they know, I'm called to be a missionary for the rest of my life. I'm willing to sacrifice everything for the Lord but they didn't know what that looked like and smelled like. And when they got out there, it was too much. And they didn't have a local church backing them up and putting their hands, arms around them and saying, it's okay, you can make it. We'll help you. We'll help you. It's what the local church does. A missionary going out from a local church is an extension of that local church. They're a member at a distance and they need all the shepherding pastoral care for their particular situation that the church can give. And when that happens, that's, that's just one of the two basic things that keeps missionaries on the field. There's a lot of reasons to come off the field, and I've probably heard them all, and there's probably a thousand more that missionaries won't tell you why. But the two major things that have missionaries come back from the field is unrealistic expectations because of a lack of proper preparation and not having an accountability relationship with their sending church that communicates and holds them accountable in such a way that keeps them on through the tough times. I think Paul and Barnabas had that in the church of Antioch. Antioch was that kind of church. And part of it was because of the patience of Saul and Barnabas to wait for the church until the church was ready.
So they were sent out. Look at... Um, Look at then the church multiplying, number five, Acts 14. This is a summary that Luke gives us. They went on their first missionary journey, so we're going to turn the page to Luke 14. And uh, starting in verse 21, here's what it says. When they had preached the gospel to that city at the, at the end of the line of their first journey and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening, that's not the same Antioch, by the way, strengthening the souls of the disciples encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. That's pretty amazing. The church is multiplied now through this extension missionary effort of these two guys and their group, whoever was with them at the time. John Mark started out with them and then left. But through, through these guys taking point they preached the gospel, they taught them, and they appointed elders so that they became local fellowships of believers wherever they were. So they had leadership, they had some structure, presumably, according to, to Paul's writings later, they met regularly on Sunday for worship and for teaching, and here they are. They've, they've established communities of believers in these places. They didn't go back home until that was done. Six, the church receives reports. Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. They had spoken the word in Perga. They went down to Italia, and from there they sailed to Antioch of Syria, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles, and they remained no little time with the disciples. Well, you guys have experienced this. People coming back from the field and they hang out with you and give reports and interact with you and you get to know them and refresh the relationship again. And it's a joy. It's, it's great to see that happen. And that's what these guys did. They had an accountability relationship with their sending church. They felt responsible to let the church know what happened from all this effort of sending us out and the sacrifice of sending them out. When we uh, served in a young and Ifugao tribal group in the Philippines, it, it was amazing. Um, we, we learned so many things from them, and we taught them the gospel, and we had a New Testament translation, which was fantastic. It was a great head start. But they didn't really understand the gospel clearly. Uh, some of them were turning from their native animism, which means... Uh, a, a rudimentary religion that's based on evil spirits and a lot of even animal sacrifice. And it was uh, taking a toll on them, and that's their culture for hundreds and hundreds of years. That was their culture. That's all they really knew. We shared the gospel with them, and it was a delight. They were not captive to evil spirits. They didn't have to appease evil spirits all the time whether for real or in their imagination, they were under oppression of evil spirits in their native religion. So when they heard the gospel of Christ, it was incredibly freeing. One of the, one of the cool testimonies, I was hiking down through the rainforest at a really high elevation, about 10,000 feet coming down. I was younger, I had knees, and we were, we're wandering through this, this rainforest, darkness was falling, uh, we didn't want to stay there, but we came to the, the very next village at sort of the foot of the rainforest, and there was a guy there with his family who had become Christians because of the gospel coming. And they, they had a very simple church, right? Outdoors. Um, he was the elder for this little family, extended family gathering, and he told his testimony. He said, when the gospel first came to them, the gospel messengers shared how coming to repentance and faith in Christ alone for salvation freed him, and he received forgiveness of sins, even the sins of worship of evil spirits. And he said, that evening I walked around the bend, the trail where we lived, our hut was, to the place where the spring was to get water. And for them, their water jug was a, a bamboo thing, right? So it's this big bamboo, and you fill that up, and you take it back, and you have water at your little hut. 
And he said, my evil spirit appeared as an apparition. Figure that out in a young and Ifugal language to me. And said, if you believe this Jesus, I will kill you. Scared him. He did get the water. He returned home. He was sleepless at night. He said, you know what? I'm going to trust Jesus because the evil spirit is scared. Jesus is more powerful than the evil spirit. Isn't that amazing? Now to this people, as we worked among them and taught them and discipled them, um, I was there to help plant churches, but really I was there to help them plant churches. I'm only one guy, and I'm a really awkward white dude. And they're short, strong, mountain-climbing tribal dudes. And it's much better for them in their language. You know, my language was okay, but it wasn't very good. I couldn't say apparition in a young and Ifugao. But um, they, they could do it much better. So I just told them, I think what the Scripture says... Uh, Antioch was kind of end of the line as far as we know historically for where the gospel had penetrated at that point in that direction anyway. So here we go. What the scripture seems to indicate to us by modeling and by instruction is that if there is a place that needs a gospel-centered, Bible-teaching church near you, if there's not a church like that near you, you have an obligation to plant a church there. So if there's a village that's like, you know, a couple hours down the valley, up the mountain on the other side, and you can see that village and you know there's no Christians there, and they haven't come to know Christ and worship Him like we do, you have an obligation to go share the gospel until they do. It was amazing. It was It was amazing. Um, I don't know exactly what they thought of me telling them that. But they did it. It wasn't Scripture, exactly. It was this awkward, tall, white dude telling them, this is what I think the Scripture says about reaching your people and your language group for Christ. This is what you do. And so little by little, their practice was, as their church was formed, then they kind of did the reconnaissance to figure out what's the next village that needs a church and then they would go there on Sundays and preach the gospel and preach the gospel until they had believers and then they would baptize them and they would keep going back teaching them all things I commanded you until they had elders and then when they had elders then they would look for another village and that village would look for a village you follow that so the original Bible translator for the New Testament thought that our language group was just in one big valley and it was about 4,000 people. It turns out that it was 40,000 speakers across four provinces because our people were like the downcast hillbillies of the region. They were the least educated, had the least affluence, and so people looked down on them. They were in the little nooks and crannies of the mountains, which made it really great for an awkward, tall, white dude to go visit the villages. But that's... That's what we did, and that's how we taught them. Do you know, when we came, there were maybe 12 not well-organized meetings of believers in villages. Ten years later, there were a hundred established churches with a plurality of elders and at least 25 baptized believers from more than two families because that was their definition of what a recognized Bible church should be. I said, that's not biblical. I said, that's okay, that's what we think it ought to be. Because if there's only two families, then you're going to have polarization and fighting, and you guys never do that here. So anyway, but you know, they know their culture, and they said it needs to be believers from at least three families, and it needs to have at least 25 baptized believers and a plurality of elders in order to be a recognized Bible church of Ayang and Ifugao churches. That was amazing. I didn't even visit some of these places. I visited a lot of them, but I didn't visit all of them because they just kept extending and extending. We left the field because the mission asked me to try to do that in other places with other people, right? So um, we, we did, by God's grace, encourage and train missionaries to do that kind of thing and learn indigenous church planning principles 
so that it could be multiplied all over the place. After we left, there was another hundred churches planted. That is God's awesome grace. What does it take to be a Great Commission church? It's taking your faith seriously. It's being recognized as a Christian. It's by looking to that next place that doesn't have Christians that you could plant a church in, whether that's locally or around the globe. I encourage churches to be focused, like you can't go everywhere and do everything. But if your end goal is church planting, and that's what I think the Great Commission says it has to be, you have to, it's churches planting churches who plant churches. That takes care of their everlasting need. No matter what their humanitarian or community development need is or medical or whatever, it pales in consideration to what happens after death for the rest of eternity. And we have the answer to that. So we send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God, the Apostle John says. And we ought to support people like these that we may be fellow workers for the truth. There's a guy I met named Muhammad, and that's the most popular name in Islam, so it could be several million of those guys. But this one uh, was in North Africa, and he had come to Christ as a collegian. He went back to his hometown. He told people that he was a Christian, and there was a sect of terrorist kind of people there, and they said, we're going to kill you. He said, that's okay. I'm a Christian. I'm going to stay a Christian. And then they changed it up. He went back to college. They said, well, we're not going to kill you. We're going to kill your little sister. They thought that threat would get him. So he's riding the train back from the major city where the university is out to the town where he lived, along with a roommate. And the roommate wasn't a believer. And the, believer, and the non-believer is telling Muhammad, listen, they might kill your sister. That's terrible. You can't allow that. That's so dishonorable. It's horrible. You need to recant and stop believing in Christ. And the guy just, Muhammad just shared the gospel with him and said, no, this is too sweet. I'm, I'm not going to give up Christ. It's better than anything I've ever known before. The guy says, really, you could die. And Muhammad turns to his friend and says, if you would trust Christ, it would be worth it. That's all in for the gospel. That's what I want to be. You want to be that way? You want Southside to be that way? Our minds and hearts are assaulted every day with human needs, tragic human crises, sometimes overwhelming consequences of sin. We have to steel ourselves against compassion fatigue. It would be easy even for a Christian to feel depressed. Our resources are so small compared to the magnitude of it all across the nation, across the world. We consciously tune it out. Yet as believers, we have the solution one person at a time. Though we cannot solve all of these problems, we have ex the exclusive answer to the greatest need of humanity. Forgiveness of sins, eternal salvation, right relationship with God. The Apostle Peter says it this way in Acts 4.12, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Paul says it later in Romans, which you've heard four years ago. Romans 1.16 I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Jesus said it this way in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Do we have a glorious gospel or what? We know the answer to the most basic human problem. Our church has the answer to the most basic human problem. 
And we have the joyous opportunity and responsibility to share the gospel and plant churches everywhere for his glory. Let's pray. Father, we are uh, incredibly humbled by just this passage of faithfulness of Barnabas and Saul, who later became known as Paul, in the Antioch church. We see the model. We, we see it in the Great Commission. All those who heard the Great Commission did church planting, and that's the record of Acts, and that's the appeal of the epistles. Continue to grow churches and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ through living communities that worship him and obey his word. Lord, we want to be those people. Please help us today. Help us this week, this month, to honor and glorify you by how we respond to the Lord Jesus Christ and this word. In Jesus' name, amen.